Let us pray. God of every moment of our lives, open your good news to us and us to your good news in Jesus Christ. Amen. A story from the second chapter of the Gospel according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I'm sure you've heard the story about the family heading out for their annual beach vacation. As with most annual beach vacations, they have a long drive ahead. And not far into the trip, and not unexpectedly, the kiddos in the back seat begin to get very, very whiny. Pretty soon comes that predictable question. Are we there yet? <laughs> and then the barrage of other questions. How many more miles? What time will we get there? How much farther? How much longer, Daddy? And finally, Daddy's had enough. Now, if he were Jack Pearson, father of the three Pearson children in the acclaimed This Is Us drama series, he would most likely be very patient and understanding. He would offer some wise, fatherly something that Randall and Kevin and Kate would recall as a life lesson later on in adulthood. Not this dad. With one eye on the road and the other one glaring into the rearview mirror, he announces in a most exasperated and authoritative tone, do not ask me that again. I don't want to hear it. We'll get there when we get there. Silence falls. Minutes pass. Finally, a quiet, plaintive voice from the back seat asks, Daddy, how old will I be when we get to the beach? <laughs> The season of Lent is very predictable. It's 40 days in length, but 40 days is 40 days, and in the Bible, we know that's a very long time. And the destination is always Jerusalem. It's not a beach vacation that awaits us there, at least not at the very beginning. So given all of that, it's very tempting to turn on cruise control and beeline it to our destination and get all of the unpleasantness over with. It's the old do not pass go, do not collect $200 approach. But the invitation has come this year to slow down long enough to observe some of the road signs along Lenten Lane, as it were, and what they might mean for our individual lives and for our life together. And some of the observations we've made over the previous couple of weeks are these. Lent means giving up the things we want so that we can focus on what God wants. It's about disentangling ourselves from distractions that pull us away from God. Within this season is the reminder that there's no new life to be had without first giving up the old. There's the reminder that we are expected to follow Jesus, not the other way around. And given all of that, maybe it's time to stop the way we're doing things and try, or more accurately, retry God's way. Maybe it's time to adjust, to amend, to reprioritize. But a lot of things can and do hamper our journey. We discovered that there are potholes on Lenten Lane. 
There are detours, steep curves, heavy traffic, and more. And then pops up the sign that no traveler wants to see, congestion ahead. Some of the worst traffic congestion I've ever seen was in Cairo, Egypt. I may have told you before that one of my greatest feats in life thus far is having driven in Cairo and lived to tell about it. The no markings on the streets to indicate lanes and such, and even if there had been, I don't think it really would have made a difference. There seem to be two basic rules. If your car is slightly ahead of mine, it's my responsibility not to hit you. And if my car is slightly ahead of yours, it's your responsibility not to hit me. And beyond that, I couldn't figure anything out. And as you can imagine, intersections were the most challenging. Multiple lanes of traffic diverged from four different directions with no apparent right of way. And somehow things kept moving, albeit ever so slowly. That's because several passengers would routinely get out of their cars while the driver stayed put and proceed to negotiate, persuade, bully, whatever, to get their particular drivers through the mayhem. One of the passengers in the car I was driving was my Egyptian friend who was a doctor. She would get out and tell other folks that she had an urgent appointment to keep. I wonder if warning signs about congestion were posted around Jerusalem the day Jesus was there. It was Passover, which meant that the city was filled to the brim with people. Jesus was there with everyone else to observe the festival that celebrated God's deliverance of the Hebrew people from Egypt. And being a faithful Jew, Jesus heads to the temple, considered to be the dwelling place of God on earth in which that day had its own issues with congestion. Now, Jesus expects to see the vendors at the temple peddling animals to be used for sacrifices. Such animals had to be unblemished, so pilgrims would buy them there instead of dragging critters all the way from the long journey from home. And Jesus expects to see money changers. They were needed to convert the Roman imperial coins into Hebrew temple coins, which was the only currency allowed in that sacred place. But what Jesus obviously did not expect to see is the way in which these transactions were taking place within the walls of the temple itself. The temple had become a kind of shopping mall rather than a place of worship. And as is the case in so many times, at so many times, the poor were being overwhelmed by the system. Vendors were engaging in price gouging, sort of like the difference between buying a box of junior mints at the theater rather than going to the dollar store and getting them beforehand, or like venturing to Disney World and discovering the price of a character meal. One commentator paints the setting at the temple in this, shall we say, slightly sarcastic way. It's Passover week, and it's a mob scene. The temple is a tourist attraction, religion at its apex. Here are all the religious instincts of humanity on display. There's liturgical dance in the sanctuary, performance art in the courtyard, a rock mass in the nave. You can buy a tour guide in the narthex, a cookbook in the transept, a bumper sticker in the fellowship hall. White wa Weight Watchers meets in the education wing. Yoga is in the gym. AA is in the media room. There's a prayer group in the basement, a flower show in the courtyard, and group therapy in the reception room. And you can get your money changed at five convenient ATM locations. What a temple. What a church. God must be very pleased. So Jesus takes action that day. He braids together strips of leather or maybe rope and makes a whip of cords, and he puts it to use. It seems as if the temple vendors, the money changers, those of the religious ranks back then had lost their focus. They'd let other interests and priorities crowd in on the foundational reason they were there to begin with. and They had lost sight of their purpose which was to support those who came to the temple to worship Yahweh. It was as if the rituals and the rules they had designed to help with worship had actually become the objects of worship themselves. They were the latest folks to, if not forget, at least stray from the covenant God had established with them. 
It's a running theme throughout scripture, especially through the Old Testament. God keeps saying, you must not have other gods before me. Don't make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever. And the people of God keep wandering off and letting other things come in between them and their maker. And so God uses the prophets throughout history to call the people back. The prophet Hosea reminds the people that God desires steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Amos is more direct. I hate, I despise your feasts, says the Lord, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, but let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And Micah offers this. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? How about thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? I'll do whatever it takes. I'll be utterly and passionately and fanatically religious if that's what you want. Micah continues, God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? And it's out of that robust prophetic tradition that Jesus acts when he cleanses the temple that day. The cleansing of the temple is one of 11 stories about Jesus that is found in all four versions of the gospel. So that gives it particular importance. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar in where they place the story. They put it near the end of their gospels. They have Jesus heading into Jerusalem and to the temple after, after his triumphal entry, the thing we celebrate on Palm Sunday, just days before his arrest and his trial and crucifixion. His actions in the temple at that point was the last straw for the religious authorities who were itching to find enough evidence to stop him and the insurrection he was creating. But John's perspective is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He places this story not at the end, but near the beginning of his gospel. It's actually the first public appearance of Jesus in John's version. Just prior to this event, Jesus had attended a private wedding in Cana where he had turned water into wine. But this is the first public occasion. And John uses the story to jumpstart Jesus' ministry. For John, this episode in the temple isn't so much about the system of temple sacrifice as it is about the inauguration of a new reality. Before this instant incident, the temple was the house of God, my father's house, as Jesus said. And now with bold decisiveness, Jesus is letting it be known that he is on the scene as a living temple. He is the word made flesh, calling people back to the commandment of placing God as the first priority, of loving God with heart and mind and soul and strength and loving neighbor as oneself. There's a reason the Ten Commandments begin where they do. One preacher calls it a breathtaking announcement of freedom. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I am the Lord your God. And because of that, you are free not to need any other gods. You're free to rest on the seventh day. You're free from the tyranny of lifeless idols. You're free from murder and stealing and greed as ways to establish yourself in the land. You're free from all of that. What is it that gets in the way of you being the person God intends for you to be? What is it that gets in the way? Is it anxiety? Is it addiction, anger, achievement, remorse? What is it that gets in the way of you being the person God intends for you to be? Whatever it is, whatever it is, maybe this Lenten season can be a time to clear out that stuff, to navigate through 
the congestion, the clear out space for God in your life. After all, it is important to keep our eyes on the road and both hands on the wheel as we make our way to Jerusalem. May it be so for you and for me. Amen.